Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Miller. I'm the executive director here at the Shippensburg Historical Society. And today we're going to talk a little bit about a forgotten topic of what I refer to as the Pennsylvania campaign, but many would refer to it as the Gettysburg campaign. And that is the New York State National Guard and what they refer to as the 30 days campaign. During the last year of my employment at South Mountain State Battlefield in 2012, going into the height of the 150th uh, Susquehanna Centennial, I had the privilege of doing a series of articles that dealt with the New York State National Guard during uh, this campaign that took place in 1863. And this is what we're gonna talk a little bit about as we're moving forward here with this presentation. But at any rate, when I left South Mountain and began my uh, work up at Monterey Pass Battlefield after the museum had opened in 2014, I was able to go ahead and publish this book here that details the regimental histories as well as the movements and experiences of the New York State National Guard. And hopefully, um, if there's enough uh, interest in this book here, Maybe I can talk to the board here at Shippensburg and see if they will go ahead and give me a small budget to go ahead and print these and we can sell them here. But if you're interested and you want to learn more about what the national, this New York State National Guard did during the 1863 campaign, um, obviously you can go to my personal blog, which is uh, South Mountain CW at wordpress.com. The blog is actually called War Returns to South Mountain. Um, or you can actually visit the Monterey Pass Battlefield Museum when they open for the season. And you can purchase this for, I believe they sell them for like $10. And if there's enough interest in this, maybe I can go ahead and do my revised edition because I found a lot of really great photographs that it wasn't able to fit in here, but I found um, other photographs. So that'll be um, a project that I want to work on uh, hopefully this year. So with regards to the New York State National Guard, um, I love the story about these uh, soldiers. They're not what you would consider veteran soldiers of the Army of the Potomac. These guys were basically um, you know, sent to Pennsylvania as well as Maryland during the 1863 Confederate invasion, which resulted in the Battle of Gettysburg. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the PowerPoint that I've prepared for you. And then after that, we'll go ahead and start viewing it. So the 30 days campaign, the New York State National Guard during the 1863 Pennsylvania campaign. This is a, an excellent presentation. I've given this uh, a couple of times and a lot of folks that by the time they're finished with this don't realize that this aspect of the Gettysburg campaign had actually taken place. And it gets kind of confusing because everybody, they hear about the Army of the Potomac and they just assume that the Department of Susquehanna um, was part of the Army of the Potomac, which it was not. So. So as we know, on June 15th, 1863, the first Confederate portions of their army forded the Potomac River um, at Williamsport and had made their way into the Cumberland Valley as far as Chambersburg by that evening. As part of the Union response, President Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation calling for about 100,000 men to muster into the state's militia. And we're talking states like Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And of course, this kind of fell on deaf ears with um, these states. So June 16th, the Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, went ahead and contacted New York Governor Horatio Seymour to see if he could go ahead and muster up the New York State National Guard in response to this invasion that occurs in the North. At the same time, Lincoln also expanded his proclamation to include states such as um, what would become West Virginia as well as Ohio. So with uh, New York Governor Seymour 
On June 16th, he issues out his orders to mobilize 14,000 men from 26 regiments to serve in both Pennsylvania as well as Maryland during the Confederate invasion. And as you can see in a lot of these photographs, um, their uniforms are particularly uh, interesting. This slide here is just a breakdown of, you know, when the troops left New York, who the commander was, as well as the strength. One particular, uh, actually two particular regiments I want you to focus on is the 8th as well as the 71st, because those guys really play an important role here in, in the Cumberland Valley, particularly with Carlisle, Shippensburg, Scotland, as well as Chambersburg. And of course, this is pretty much the order of battle um, in which the New York State National Guard would serve in. So the Baltimore area, those regiments were part of the middle department. Here in the Cumberland Valley, particularly with Harrisburg being as the headquarters, they served in the Department of Susquehanna. Some of the uniforms, like I said, um, I know when you're thinking of the American Civil War, a lot of people think of the early war when the Confederates are wearing blue, the Union um, are still wearing parts of their gray uniforms. The New York State National Guard was very colorful in the fact that many of them still retained their gray fatigue uniforms as well as their dress uniforms, while others uh, had pretty much adopted their blue uniforms, um, similar to what the Union Army was wearing. So looking at this slide here, we have the typical field jacket or fatigue jacket that would have been worn here in 1863 in Pennsylvania, as well as down in Baltimore. The only difference would be the black trim that you see on the cuffs, the shoulder boards, as well as the collar. And of course, you can see an excellent photograph of the 7th New York. That photograph was actually taken in 1861 uh, I believe around the Baltimore area where the Inner Harbor is. But some of the other uniforms that we're talking about, uh, like the 12th New York State National Guard, um, as you can see, they have what we would call or classify as like a New York shell jacket or what they would call a New York State jacket. Um, you also see the, he's wearing the typical blue trousers. And if you look at his kepi, would be a little more color there. The 22nd New York, they were known as the Strawberry Grays. They had gray uniforms as far as their dress was concerned, but they also had um, trim on the jackets as well as on their trousers that had pretty much um, like a red stripe with gold inlay. And on the back of my book here, this is a pretty good presentation of what the 22nd New York would look like as far as your dress. Now here in Pennsylvania, most likely they would have worn um, fatigue jackets very similar to what the Army of the Potomac was being issued. And then the 23rd New York, for the most part, these guys, with the exception of some of the design on the trim, these guys pretty much look identical to what the 7th New York was wearing. Again, you have the uniform of the 8th New York, gray um, with black trim. The 13th New York, as you can see from the previous slide, their uniform looks very similar to that of the 23rd. So when they're here in Pennsylvania, you can kind of see how that would be a little confusing, um, particularly with the civilians here. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those stories as well. Here we have more of the traditional uniforms. Um, these guys here from the 71st, they're wearing what I would refer to as the New York State jackets as well, which is dark blue, basically with a New York style French, French style kepi, and of course the sky blue trousers. The only difference is, as you can see, is that they have white trappings as far as like their accoutrements are concerned. So when the New York State National Guard, obviously the seventh is the first one to basically leave out of New York um, and then followed by like the eighth and 71st. As they're making their way on train toward Philadelphia on June 17th, that's where the dividing point is going to be. Because with the targets not exactly known as to where the Confederate Army is going to hit at, 
It could be Harrisburg at this point. It could be Baltimore at this point. I mean, heck, it could even be Washington, D.C., for all we know. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as the trains are arriving in Philadelphia, the 7th would be directed to like Philadelphia, for example, and then the next two regiments were directed over to Philadelphia. Now, the 7th New York, when they arrived in Baltimore, these guys were welcomed very warmly. They were given uh, pretty much a, a very nice reception by the people of Baltimore. And for the most part, these guys are um, going to guard like the Inner Harbor. And then as the Battle of Gettysburg is unfolding, these guys are basically going to start escorting prisoners by rail from Baltimore to Fort Delaware. However, the soldiers that came here to Pennsylvania, and particularly with Harrisburg, they were given kind of like an unwelcome and a very cold reception. And in fact, many of the businesses in Harrisburg went ahead and closed their doors, or they went ahead and um, inflated the prices of goods uh, for the New York soldiers. And one interesting drawing that comes from the Harper's Weekly, which I love, is on the left side of your screen here, you have a member of the New York State National Guard scratching his head because of the fact that the store clerk is selling Susquehanna water six cents per glass. Some of the tensions within the streets um, became increasingly high, but the New Yorkers, when they arrived in Pennsylvania, they were viewed as the invaders and not necessarily as the defenders of the Commonwealth. Because of that, the New Yorkers are going to get very cocky and rightfully so, they're being treated um, very poorly. And because of that fact, the tempers are going to begin to flare. One of the things during this campaign that really ticks off the New York State National Guard is the fact that there's so many white, able-bodied men, particularly young men, that are roaming the streets of Harrisburg, as well as some of the other communities. And the whole thing to them is, okay, Lincoln issued out a call for these men to join the militia, but if they don't care about defending their own commonwealth, then why are the New Yorkers there doing it for them? And because of those feelings, and because of tempers, some of the very first New York troops that arrived in Harrisburg actually start getting into fistfights with the population. And it gets to the point where many of these New York troops have to be rushed through the streets of Harrisburg and get into Camp Curtin. So that was one of the responses to calming the feelings was to rush as many of these soldiers to Camp Curtin um, that Camp Curtin could quickly muster in to avoid any conflict within the people of Harrisburg. Other regiments that they arrived, such as the uh, 65th New York, um, they arrived in train cars some of these regiments were ordered to remain on the train cars for about 24 hours until Camp Curtin could uh, receive them. And because of the way they were being treated, being thrown into box cars, for an example, that contained livestock, a lot of the New York troops, uh, particularly from the Buffalo area, they pretty much started making all kinds of animal sounds and stuff like that in Harrisburg just to kind of make fun of the situation that they were in. So one of the responsibilities for many of the New York troops as they arrived in Harrisburg was to quickly begin making earthworks at the various fortifications on the west shore of the Susquehanna River. And with that, they are going to put out a call to the Harrisburg civilians to you know, pitch in and give them a hand. And this is where tempers once again flare up. Many African-Americans answered the New Yorkers call and not very many young white abled men. So now you have African Americans, uh, civilians that are now working shoulder to shoulder with the New Yorkers. And of course, the younger white population for the most part are still wandering the streets of Harrisburg uh, without a care as to if the Confederate invasions even wanna make it that far. So by June 19th, the 8th New York, as well as the 71st New York regiments of the State National Guard, 
they were given orders and their commanding officer in their brigade was a, um, an individual by the name of Brigadier General Joseph Farmer Knight. His orders were to not fully engage the Confederate Army as they're coming into the Cumberland Valley, but basically to have enough numbers to kind of make a stand to make the advanced units of the Confederate Army to rethink um, about moving forward. And what they're trying to do is they're, they're creating a smoke screen for what it is. So they're going to go ahead on June 19th, as I was saying, they're going to go ahead and board the train cars, make their way through Carlisle. They're going to go ahead and arrive here at Shippensburg at midnight on June 20th. And from there, they're going to go ahead and march to Scotland. While they're at Scotland, Scotland, they're to um, help the civilian population there to repair as well as guard the um, railroad uh, supply depots and houses of the Cumberland Valley Railroad that were destroyed by Confederate General Brigadier General Albert Jenkins's cavalry a couple of days prior. From there, the 8th New York State National Guard on June 21st is going to march into Chambersburg. And that's where Rachel Cormany, who was a Chambersburg resident, she got excited when she wrote in her diary. She said, the news came in that the rebels are here, which caused great excitement again. Soon after, a regiment of the New York Grays came, so all the excitement died away. But the Chambersburg citizens went ahead and lined up around the diamond where the modern day uh, fountain is. They lined up all kinds of tables with all kinds of edibles. And the 8th New York State National Guard was treated very well until tempers once again flared. While these troops were moving about in Chambersburg, they noticed the same similar situation as, as they observed in Harrisburg. You have a, a lot of young, able white men who did not answer Abraham Lincoln's call. Soon, words are going to be shouted, pushing matches will take place, and eventually fistfights are going to break out. One New York soldier went ahead and insulted a member of the 126th Pennsylvania, which had mustered out of service because of the fact that there was nothing left of this regiment after the battles of Lake Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. And in fact, one of the New Yorkers insulted an ex-captain of that regiment um, when they tried stealing his pocket watch. So once again, the New Yorkers are gonna be escorted through Chambersburg and they're gonna make their camp about two miles south of right on the Valley Turnpike or modern day Route 11. And that is where the people of Chambersburg um, really pretty much had enough. Even in 1864, not even a month after Brigadier General John McCausland came in with the ransom of Chambersburg, which led to the burning of that town or city, there was an editorial in, in the Franklin Repository. And it says, save us now and hereafter from New York sympathy. But above all things else, save us from the New York militia. Come Jenkins, come Mosby, come McCausland, but against another visitation of the New York militia, good Lord defend us. In other words, the people of Chambersburg would rather have the person responsible for burning their town revisit them than for them to host a New York State National Guard ever again. And this does become an issue because in 1864, New York did not respond to the proclamation with the third and final invasion of the North. So like I said, General uh, Knipe and his brigade of the two New, New York res um, the two New York regiments were basically ordered to stall the advance. So after the, uh, the tracks as well as the uh, stock houses of Scotland were rebuilt around the railroad. The 71st New York State National Guard uh, was ordered directly into Chambersburg on the 22nd. And of course, these guys were pretty much rushed through and they marched right to the camp of the 8th New York. Now, this is where it gets real interesting because to the south at a place called Greencastle, Brigadier General Albert Jenkins and his cavalry brigade had been ordered to retake and reclaim all the ground that they had lost. 
So once they get to Greencastle, just a little bit north, Boyd's 1st Lincoln, New York Cavalry skirmishes uh, with the advanced units of Jenkins's Cavalry. And as a result, the first blood spilled on Northern soil takes place. And that is where Corporal uh, William Ryle uh, was killed. And if you go down on Route 11 toward Greencastle, there is a monument dedicated to him just before you get to uh, Greencastle itself. So Boyd's Cavalry retreats back to Chambersburg where they run into the 8th as well as the 71st. And Boyd reports to Knight about the situation about the Confederate Cavalry coming. Knight, realizing that he is not to get into a full-fledged engagement, decides to go ahead and order a withdrawal from Chambersburg. Somehow or another, this order turned into the Chambersburg races and it became every man for themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. The New Yorkers left Chambersburg in such a rush that they pretty much left everything behind in their camps, including their tents, as well as some of their personal items, um, kitchenware as well. And somehow or another, they were ordered to Scotland where they would board the rail cars that would take them directly to Carlisle. However, some of the New Yorkers did not uh, board those train cars. And as a result, they're pretty much forced to march past Shippensburg before the train would come back. Now, approximately one to two companies of the 8th New York State National Guard was ordered to remain with Boyd's Cavalry. So after these guys retreated out of Chambersburg, the next town where they would make a stand is Shippensburg. So two miles south of Shippensburg on the Valley Turnpike, they're going to go ahead and wait for the advancement of Jenkins's cavalry. So by June 23rd, skirmish occurs, and Boyd's cavalry, as well as these two companies of the 8th New York, are pretty much skirmishing right in the streets of Shippensburg. And it gets to the point where Boyd's cavalry men start barricading the square of Shippensburg to try to prevent Jenkins from capturing any of his men. From that point, Boyd is going to go ahead and order a simple withdrawal from Shippensburg. And of course, Shippensburg residents, they're pretty much ready for the occupation of the Confederate Army to begin. However, Jenkins, realizing that there were troops directly in his front and not knowing those numbers, he will not occupy Shippensburg until a day later after more reconnaissance was conducted. So now you got these two regiments of the New York State National Guard along with Pennsylvania militia, and they're gonna go ahead and start digging fortifications or trenches just south of Carlisle. So from June 24th to June 25th, these regiments are gonna be pretty much taking up position on all sides. So you have, for an example, the 71st on the main road that leads into Cumberland or Carlisle, and then the 8th New York is going to go ahead and take up positions on or near the intersection where Walnut Bottom Road comes in contact. But at 10 p.m. on June 25th, General Joseph Knight decided to go ahead and fall back to Kingston in the pouring rain. And because of that, Jenkins's cavalry will go ahead and start occupying Carlisle shortly after. By June 27th, Knight's brigade is at Oyster Point where they're gonna go ahead and skirmish with some of Jenkins's men. Some of these skirmishes are gonna be some, what they would know are called the, the northernmost um, battles that took place during the Civil War, so to speak. So General Joseph Knight, for the most part, he did complete his task, which is to stall the Confederate advance. But by doing so, he's buying precious time for the defenses of Harrisburg to be completed. So basically, Knight, who advanced over 50 miles beyond the main defenses, he managed to keep the uh, Confederate cavalry in check for six days. The 23rd New York, uh, when they arrived in Harrisburg, they're basically going to be working out of, I believe, Fort Washington. And here's a great example of what one of those soldiers would have looked like. And of course, uh, they will march down toward Carlisle. Um, and before they are pretty much halted. The 13th New York State National Guard, um, they're gonna work on the defenses of Fort Washington as well as Camp Crook, 
located at Fenwick, which is now Marysville today. The 12th New York, um, they were ordered to guard the railroad bridges at Marysville and Fenwick, where Dolphin and Susquehanna Valleys connect. And as you can see in this photograph here, a lot of these guys, for the most part, um, were wearing blue uniforms. The 22nd New York State National Guard, I love this photograph. It was taken in 1861 at Harpers Ferry, but it demonstrates how the tactics of forming a square would have looked. But these guys, while they were in Harrisburg, they guarded the York Road at Camp Cox, and they also dug rifle pits as part of the defenses of Harrisburg itself. And of course, the 22nd and the 37th New York, um, these guys are going to go ahead and take uh, part in a battle of Sporting Hill. And as you can see, the Eberly Barn Foundation, this is pretty much what's left of the site today of this famous skirmish. And then you get to Carlisle, July 1st, 1863. And this is where portions of William Smith's division of New York State National Guardsmen, including the 22nd, um, are in Carlisle. And they're going to resist the bombardment um, as well as refusing to surrender um, the city to Major General Jeb Stewart and his cavalry division. One of the things that was interesting about um, this particular um, event in Carlisle was the Pennsylvania artillery that was there, uh, Miller's Battery. And these guys, for the most part, had not been trained how to harness the horses, nor had they been trained on how to operate a cannon. And of course, during the bombardment, it was noted by one of the officers um, that they were loading the cannon backwards and he had to quickly stop them. Again, as I said in the beginning, these are not veteran soldiers and they do not have the training um, that the majority of the Army of the Potomac did. The 68th New York, um, they were located at High Spire, which is just south of Harrisburg, and their job was to picket, uh, picket the uh, river fords of the Susquehanna River. Meanwhile, down to our south in Baltimore, the 7th New York State National Guard, they are pretty much taking it easy. And again, the feelings of these men with the civilians down there, these guys were treated very warmly. And aside from basically barricading some of the roads leading into Baltimore, the 7th pretty much had it pretty easy. And you can see one of the fortification cannons there um, that's looking directly toward the Baltimore Harbor. Well, when the Battle of Gettysburg unfolds on July 1st, it is quickly realized that the Confederates are no longer targeting Harrisburg, and maybe at this point in time, they're targeting Baltimore. But either way, both armies are going to go ahead and commit to the Battle of Gettysburg, which will be fought July 1st, 2nd, and finally on July 3rd. Going into July 4th, the Confederate Army um, under the command of General Robert E. Lee had made the decision to go ahead and withdraw their forces from Pennsylvania and make their retreat back into Virginia. As a result, the Army of the Potomac under the newly um, commander, Major General George Meade, his army is tired. They have marched um, without the majority of their supplies. Their supplies are well back behind the battlefield lines and uh, Westminster. Many of the Union Army troops, as far as their appearance, their uniforms were in tatters. And just plainly put, the Army was used up. So General George Meade sends out an order to Major General Darius Couch, who is the commander of the Department of Susquehanna, asking him if it would be okay for him to deploy some of his garrison there for these uh, soldiers to take part in trying to catch up to Robert E. Lee's retreating army and if necessary, try to block the main passes of South Mountain. 
So Major General William Smith's entire division is ordered to pursue the Confederate Army, which is retreating through South Mountain at this particular time via Cash Town. So his troops will go ahead and board the trains. They'll get to Carlisle. From there, they'll have to march to Mount Holly Springs on foot. And as they're getting closer and closer to Mount Holly Springs, the wall of South Mountain keeps getting taller and taller and taller. And here we have a beautiful aerial view of what Mount Holly Springs looks like. And as you can see, the type of terrain that these soldiers are going to have to march through. Well, all of a sudden, the storm of a century comes in. And if anybody knows me from my experiences um, as the historian for the Monterey Pass battlefield, the night of July 4th, a major severe thunderstorm had rolled through. That same thunderstorm where those troops are fighting it out on top of South Mountain at Monterey Pass, the New York State National Guard is also kind of fighting for their lives in South Mountain as well, just further to the north. One New York soldier said, over against the mountain wall before and above us, there hung in midair a vast sheet of water which the howling wind flapped to and fro in the gorge terif uh, terrifically, while blinding lightning and crashing thunder seemed to issue together from the mountain itself. Once they reach Paper Town, so you march through Mount Holly Springs on, I think it's Route 94, the next town is Paper Town. And it used to be a paper mill there. And once these New York troops got into this area here, this is where many of the creeks began overflowing their banks. And of course, when you're marching to Mount Holly Springs, you have yellow breaches. Um, and then after that becomes Hunter's Run. So when they entered into the wilderness, um, the calm mountain brook um, that many of these men had marched through had become a raging torrent, threatening the whole gorge with overflow carrying angrily downstream of knapsacks and officer releases. Half of Smith's division was able to get through Hunter's Creek or Hunter's Run, while the other half had to basically return or about face and return to Paper Town before the, uh, the creek would allow them to ford it. So as the troops start marching up South Mountain, the next area is going to be Pine Grove Furnace. And once they're on top of the mountain in this area here, many of the buildings that you see in the photograph, as well as the community, those people are going to open up those buildings for the Pennsylvania militia. Unfortunately for the New Yorkers, they're going to be forced to sleep out in the rain all night long. And of course, while they're at Pine Grove Furnace, um, General Smith orders that the artillery, as well as detachments of New York troops, be deployed at the intersection that overlooks the roads leading into Shippensburg as well as Gettysburg and to uh, Cashtown, where Caledonia Ironworks is. And at the same time, they're still guarding the road leading out of Mont Holly Springs as well as the other road leading from Gettysburg. The next day on July 5th, the, um, the rains begin to subside a little bit, and that's where the South Mountain State, uh, the <laughs> South Mountain but the New York State National Guard, they were, they were ordered to Gettysburg via Cash Town. So as they wait for the rest of the division to catch up to them, they're gonna go ahead and take the road leading down to Bendersville, Pennsylvania, which is very rough and windy. And they're gonna march through this area of South Mountain uh, all day on July 5th. They get to Bendersville where they'll camp at. The next day they are ordered to Cash Town well, the, where they will arrive on the evening of July 6th. And of course, if you're a student of the retreat from Gettysburg, as you know, the Confederate wagons, as well as the columns of ambulances at Cashtown Gap had pretty much left or had already gone, were gone by this point in time. So General George Meade had issued orders for the New Yorkers to meet his army at Gettysburg. Well, he countercommanded those orders, and by July 7th, they are ordered to go ahead and march directly to Waynesboro. See, as the Confederate infantry had retreated through Monterey Pass, 
a detachment of the 6th Corps, which was one brigade of infantry under the command of Brigadier General Thomas Neal, as well as a brigade of cavalry under the command of Colonel McIntosh. The New York State National Guard Pennsylvania Militia with um, uh, General Smith were ordered to go ahead and head to Waynesboro and hook up with those units and pursue the Confederates that were retreating directly to Hagerstown and Williamsport. <clears throat> so by the night of the 7th, the New York State National Guard had made their way to Mont Auto and in the fields near the Little Antietam Creek, they went ahead and encamped when another major rainstorm took place and the banks of the Antietam began to overflow with, with the contents of the stream. Many of these soldiers woke up in the middle of the night um, with pretty much with water coming right over top of them. Some of them almost drowned. And of course, the next morning on July 8th, they went past the arresting individual's house of Captain John Cook, who was one of John Brown's followers um, that, took play, uh, that took part in the, uh, the insurrection at Harper's Ferry. And of course, as they marched past his house, and of course he wasn't home, but his wife was, they all started singing John Brown's body uh, lays in a molten grave. By the evening of July 8th, they finally make their way into Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. Again, one day after the Confederates had retreated through this area. And of course, they were ushered out on the Leitersburg Turnpike about two miles south of town and they were not allowed to visit any of the stores. They were not allowed to basically have any communication with the Waynesboro population. Again, this was to control the tempers. They're gonna hang out in the fields uh, near the Antietam Creek, close to the Mason-Dixon line for several days. They're gonna wait number one for rations to come in as well as to be resupplied. And then from there, they're gonna go ahead and make their way into Boonesboro, Maryland, where they eventually hook up with the Army of the Potomac. So on the early morning hours of July 11th, the New Yorkers had marched through Leitersburg. And of course, this was during the, we're talking like the night, but they were moving to Hagerstown and then they were basically told to about face march back to Leitersburg, Maryland. And as one soldier recalled it, when they marched through Leitersburg in the middle of the night, they didn't even realize it was a town. But when they marched back, he recalled that Leitersburg was one of those towns where you basically blink an eye and you're through it. That's how small it was. From there, they're to take the road that leads directly into Smithsburg. Next to Smithsburg is a place called Cave Town. And on July 12th, a huge severe thunderstorm had rolled through and many of the troops began to take refuge in the surrounding areas of Smithsburg as well as Cave Town. Some of the soldiers even tried setting up their tents and were hiding underneath the trees and of course some of the New Yorkers were injured when lightning struck those areas. Some of the New Yorkers had no place to go so they went ahead and stacked their rifles in the middle of the road and as one soldier from the 22nd New York recalled, he could see that the uh, bayonet tips were glowing and electricity was just bouncing off from tip to tip. Apparently one of the rifles, even though it had the muzzle up, apparently some of the powder was just dry enough that with this electrical spark, his rifle was discharged. So by July 13th, they were ordered to Boonesboro, Maryland. And once they get into this area here, they're starting to connect with the Army of the Potomac under the command, again, of Major General George Meade. Here, a lot of the Union soldiers of the Army of the Potomac were making fun of the New Yorkers simply because, number one, gray uniforms. Number two, because of the white um, trappings that they had in front of their bodies. As one Union veteran put it, you present an excellent target for any sharpshooter to shoot at. So the New Yorkers finally had made way and connected with the Army of the Potomac. It looks now as if they're going to go ahead and march directly to Williamsport, which on July 14th is when the um, 
Confederate Army had basically already either A, forded or crossed over on the newly pontoon bridge that was built. At the same time, riots had broken out in New York City. And because of that, these troops were basically ordered to Frederick to Monocacy Junction, where they would board the trains that would take them directly down to Baltimore, Maryland, and from there to Philadelphia and back to New York. Here is a, uh, a drawing by, I believe it's Alfred Wald, of the New York troops marching through South Mountain at Turner's Gap. So they're going to go ahead and enter Frederick City on the evening, late evening hours of July 14th. And of course, when they get to Monocacy Junction, more rain has come into the forecast and it is nothing but a muddy mess. This photograph here is supposedly was actually uh, struck in Frederick and it shows parts of the 7th New York at Monocacy Junction. And here, if you go down to Monocacy National Battlefield, which is the site of the July 9th, 1864 battle, the battle that saved Washington, here is Monocacy Junction that lies within the boundaries of that national park. And this is where the New Yorkers would have boarded the trains that would have took them down to Baltimore. So at the same time, you have these troops uh, with uh, William Smith's division, you have other troops of the New York State National Guard, such as Yates's Brigade. By July 9th, they're ordered at Carlisle. A day later, they were ordered to the Shippensburg area. But uh, July 11th through the 14th, they are ordered to remain stationary at Chambersburg. And then from July 15th, they're ordered back to Shippensburg where they'll board the train cars that will eventually take them back to New York. Some of these troops did not leave the Harrisburg area and they were forced to remain on boxcars for several weeks afterwards, or they were stuck in Monocacy Junction because of the fact that the riots took part in New York City. Some of these other regiments that lived in the Western regions of New York were not ordered to New York right away and they were forced to basically hunker down and stay in the open elements. So with some of these troops, as they're arriving back to New York, they're going to go ahead and put down um, the draft riots. And here we have two photographs of the famous 7th New York um, at New York City. <laughs> so with that being said, I just want to say thank you uh, for watching and for um, you know, stopping by, hopefully you learn quite a lot about the New York State National Guard. Like I said, their story is quite remarkable. Um, I have nothing uh, but respect for these guys. That's why when I do the living history programs uh, for this area, I will put on my New York National Guard uh, uniform and I will do as much as I can to interpret their story because I feel that it is important. But other than that, I just want to say thank you for attending today's winter lecture series, and we'll see you.